Praise the Lord, apostolic brothers and sisters. Welcome to Five More Minutes with the one and only Jeff Arnold. We thank you for sending your questions, and we ask you to continue sending your questions regarding ministry. Remember, if you are a pastor, if you are a missionary, if you are a Sunday school teacher, an evangelist, a preacher, please go ahead and send these questions, and let's get into the Word of the Lord. Amen? Hey man, so here we go. Five more minutes with Jeff Arnold, All episode right. two. The first question is from Devin Treadway, brother Devin Treadway from the Pentecostals of Gainesville. And he asks, in a world that is filled with distractions, he is a young minister, what can a young person uh, that is pursuing ministry do to keep a focused and passionate drive for the kingdom? Uh... First, let me thank you for letting me talk. I'm really not the guy you should listen to. You need to get these educated guys, but I'm thanking you for inviting me. Now, also, I want to state up front, Brother Tenney used to tell me years ago, Jeffrey, opinions are just like noses. Everybody's got one and they all smell. So I'm just giving you my opinion. It doesn't mean I'm right, but I'm positive I am right. Anyway. This thing about distractions, now this is going to rub your fur wrong. Almost everybody in Pentecost knows I don't own a computer, I don't own an iPad, I don't own an iPhone. I'm not interested in all the Antichrist toys. I'm not. So when I make a recommendation to you, it's because it's not because it doesn't apply to me. But distractions, to me, one of the greatest distractions we've had is the Internet. I am blown away by Pentecostals and non-Pentecostals that live, eat, sleep, and drink the Internet. I see people going to church. They can't even worship God because they're on the phone. They're playing with their messages. Now, you're asking my question, Devin. Fine. I think you need to circumvent your involvement on the Internet. The Internet is not evil. It's just an information highway. But it's very addictive. And you need to somehow... To me, curtail all this surfing and start involving searching and stretching mm. for the things of God. Mm. And, uh, and you need to look at these things and say, now, is what I'm reading and what I'm looking at, is it helping me spiritually? Or is it just making me more worldly and more carnal? And, and only you can make that decision. I can't make that for you because I'm not involved with it. I don't give a flip, but I really think that, that the Internet and uh, what they call this, uh, Brother Tony always, what's that, T social media. Mm -hmm. what, and he used to talk about social media for the first five or six times. I had no idea what he's talking about. What is social media? Oh, well, it's watching the Internet. It's, it's getting all your thoughts and values and opinions and, from the Internet. Well, well, who's the idiots on the Internet? Who are these people? Are these people walking with God? Are these people hearing the voice of God? I, I don't think so. So you're really, to me, Devin, you have to, you have to turn around and say, wait a minute. I don't need to spend more time on the Internet than I do in the Word of God. And I don't need to spend more time playing all the video games and studying and praying. So, I mean, that, I, I wrote this down here about, you know, uh, trying to stay focused uh, one of the things I think, Devin, that would help you or anybody is to remember again how good God has been to us, how wonderful and faithful and precious He's been to us, right. and that, that we owe Him. And I think that that memory working in my life and yours will do two things. It will inspire us to know Him better, and it will also obligate us that we have a job to get done. So maybe that's my answer, I guess. I guess that's my answer. I, I can't hold it. Oh, well, there is another thing. How can I do that? Fine. Ask God to create a hungering and a thirsting in you for the things of God. You know, the Lord said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst of righteousness, and they shall be filled. Well, you have to create that. Just because you're saved and you're born again, that doesn't mean that that hunger and thirsting stays. To me... A large segment of the Pentecostal people were reaching for God, and then once they got saved, they put their whole life into park, mm. into neutral. And now they just come to church, throw in a couple of bucks, clap their hands, sing a song, and they don't pursue God. So how do you stay free from distraction? 
make him your attraction. Hmm. Make him your desire somehow. I want that. That doesn't mean that you're better than anybody. It, but it, now, over the years, I've been damned and condemned and railed on by the best in this movement. Fine. And I used to laugh at these morons who used to tell me, Arnold, I want to ask you something. How come you always try to be spiritual and supernatural? To which I would respond, how come you want to be carnal and worldly and ungodly? Hmm. Uh, why would a person not want to be supernaturally blessed? and spiritual in the things of God. If the church is supposed to be spiritual, I'm very, very concerned that us as a movement, UPC, that we are drifting or moving accidentally towards becoming an organization that's more administrative than it is supernatural, than it is spiritual. We need both, but it's so easy to just like have, well, business as usual, that's all. I've said it before, Alex, the trouble with people who are mediocre is that mediocre people are always at their best. And I don't understand why, Devin, why would anybody want to be average? Why? why, why, why? See, I think one of the problems that I see, and I haven't preached out lately, but I have traveled a lot, is that we've got people that don't want to make waves. They don't want to stand alone. They don't want to be, be looked at by the rest of the movement like, oh, you're something spiritual. I wish to God somebody would damn me and condemn me and blame me for being spiritual. I want to be spiritual. I want to hear the voice of God. I, so I really think every person needs to make a decision in their own lives. How much of the Internet can they tolerate that it doesn't affect them? How much watching movies or doing TV or reading the papers or reading you got to make a decision for yourself because you cannot wait for headquarters or your pastor to give you convictions. you got to get convictions on your own. So I hope that answers your question. Amen. Amen. All right, second question. It, it comes from Sister Marla Matthews from New Life Hope in Arkansas. Oh, boy. It says, regarding hearing the voice of the Lord, how do you distinguish between God, self, and and sometimes the enemy of our souls. Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, first, I recommend remember how the Lord first talked to you. Remember how he first touched you. And to me, you need to reach for that again. Okay? Now, sometimes to fully understand, is the Lord speaking to me? Well, first place, my opinion, hearing the voice of God is a practiced situation. You have to learn his voice. That's why he said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of, learn of me. Mm -hmm. We in the Pentecostal movement, we almost don't tolerate people learning spiritual things. you got to be mature. And, and I'll tell you something else. Deciding the voice of God, you can learn from mistakes. You can learn. I said, you're a school teacher. That's how you learn. You don't learn because you made 100 on the test. You learn because you made 75. Now you found out what you didn't know. God does not get mad and ticked off at his people because they make mistakes trying to understand. Secondly, I believe that the voice of God never leads you into error. It doesn't lead you into ego, vanity, pride, flesh games. The Spirit of God doesn't do that. And, and so... I have a, an example in the scriptures of that wonderful man, the prophet Samuel. But when he was just a boy, the Lord talked to him two different times. He didn't know who it was because he, he, didn't, he didn't know how to recognize the voice of God. Then a third time when Eli said, if he talks again, say, thy servant heareth. Well, so even though he was a young boy, we have the same principle working in our lives. We have to develop a sensitivity to his voice i don't know whether i told you this or not but i was i was walking in the atlanta airport did i say this already no and while i was going i just felt this impression on my mind just as i was walking going to get my plane look at that picture well i recognized there was an impression from the lord because it's a practice thing it's a learned thing that's why the scripture said in hebrews they who by reason of use 
have their senses exercised thereby. What does that mean in English? The more you do it, the better you get at it. The more you play the guitar, the better you get at it. The more, the more you try to teach and preach, the better you get at it. Learned through practice. You have to practice it. So I looked over at the picture, Alex, and it was Tiger Wood standing on the 18th green of the Masters putting for a $50,000 putt. One putt, he'd win 50 grand. Mm. Well, it was mind-boggling. I looked at it and I said, I wrote it off. I guess it wasn't the Lord. It must have been pizza or something. I turned around and went to walk away. It got stronger. It was an impression in my mind. Mm -hmm. I said, look at the picture. Well, I stopped. I turned around and went back and looked at the picture. All the people on the green are holding umbrellas, and the caddy's holding the umbrella over Tiger. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I you know, tried to help the Lord, because you really need to help him. I said, Lord, I appreciate you loving me and caring me, but you probably you missed this one. I don't play golf, okay? I don't play golf. I'm not against golf. I just don't play golf. I go to turn around and walk away. I must have went 40 feet, and it was like this thunder in me. And it wasn't a happy voice, and it said, I told you to look at that picture. <laughs> Man, I had goosebumps on my arms. I turned around and went back. I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm looking at the picture. And it was like this quickening, just boom. Read the picture. Hmm. So I turned around and read the label and it says, winners and su successful people never wait for ideal conditions. They play the hand they're dealt with. Hmm. And here it was, said, and it was like a principle to me. Many of my people are waiting for ideal situations. But no, you got to just deal with what you're dealing with. And so it really was a, a, a really an, an inspiration to me about hearing the voice of God. I have never in my life ever had the devil tell me something good. Now, he tries to fool me and seduce me, but I ask God all the time, is this voice leading me in the right way? Is it pandering to my ego or my vanity? Because I am convinced that when the voice of God begins to impress you, it will always, at the bottom, glorify and magnify God. Mm. And that's how you do it. And you'll make mistakes. Now, I realize our movement, and I'm sorry to be rude, our movement doesn't tolerate mistakes very much. God tolerates lots of mistakes. So it's kind of like you just have to learn. It's a learned practice. It's an experience. But the more you do it, the more sensitive you get. You know, folks, the Lord didn't just save us to save us and, and keep us out of hell. He saved us with another plan. Delivered from sin, here, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And the conformity requires interaction. You've got to have God talk to you. Amen. I hope I made sense. Amen. Anyway. So, will the, <coughs> will the voice of God, uh, when, when he said, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So praying, Lord, give me an ear. That's right. Hear. That's what you have to pray. You have to pray, Lord, help me to be sensitive. Help me to know. I used to do this crude, rude thing years ago in our church. They, they didn't like it. My wife got mad at it, but I did it all the time. I used to stick my finger in my mouth and I'd say, wait a minute. I'm trying to pick up which way the Spirit's leading this service. Now, I realize that's rude and crude, but I was in charge of this. I needed to know which way are we going. And sometimes you don't know. That's why Paul said in Acts 17 that we grope at times in the darkness if happily we might find him. Well, the Apostle Paul, as great and wonderful as God blessed him, could grope at times. And other times he turned around perceiving that the Lord has sent us here. Well, sometimes your perception is the only catalyst you have to decide whether you're going there. And, and you'll find out after a while. For years, Alex, I have taught people and shared this. Here's how I recognize yay and nay in the voice of God. It's like going out in a pasture and there's a wonderful big pond out there. Mm -hmm. And it's clear as glass. But when the wind comes just a little, the, gla the, the glassy water becomes choppy. That's how it is with me. 
When this thing is peaceful, fine. When it gets choppy, I realize I'm going in the wrong direction. But that works for me. I don't know what's going to work for you, but I know one thing. God wants us to recognize his voice. And he's very patient with us. And he wants to help us. And he's not going... Do you think that God that brought you out of sin would abandon you in your journey to the city? Give me a break. And you have to believe the God that you serve, he's the speaking God. He's the talking God. What's, what's really, I say, scaring me or concerning me in our movement, to me, now there's my perception, God in many services is speaking less and less and less and less. He got to keep his mouth shut. We got our program to do. We got our songs to sing. We got our announcements to make. We, what kind of junk is that? Five minutes with the king talking is a lot better than one hour of Jeff Arnold talking. But you have to learn to yield to it. And I've made mistakes. I've, I've made decisions that I thought God had inspired me to do. And I got halfway through it and it was like, Lord, did you tell me to do this or did I do something wrong? Here's why. Because when the when David had lost his wives and his children and all this stuff in Ziglag, mm -hmm. he went back to the Lord and he said, shall I pursue? And the Lord said, pursue and thou shalt doubtless recover all. Now watch, God gave him a promise, you're going to recover. You ready? He had to fight all those guys to get it back. Why do you just like the Pentecostals sit on the nice rear ends and just wait till the stuff comes? Mm -hmm. Just because you got a promise, a promise doesn't mean you don't have to fight a problem to get the promise to be possessed. They had to fight those guys. Read it, First Samuel. They had to fight. It's chapter thirty. They had to fight all the way through the night till the next day. Well, you promised me to get my stuff. Yeah. Well, you didn't tell me anything about fighting. Well, if I would have told you about fighting, you wouldn't have went. Hmm. So, I mean, it's, you have to understand that because you have a promise from God and the voice of God does not mean that that voice unknowingly to you is hiding some trouble and hiding some situations because he knows that would discourage us and defeat us. So David, well, let me tell you something else, Alex. I've preached this all over Pentecost. When you read that scripture, when David comes back to Ziglag and his things burned and he's lost his kids and all the people mm -hmm. are ready to damn him and condemn him. You find yourself this, when you're trying to be sensitive and spiritual, you'll have to stand against a lot of God's people who are stupid because mm -hmm. they're as spiritual as a dead frog. Now this has always blown my mind. I didn't steal this from anybody. God let me have it. When he prayed, said, bring me the ephod and he inquired of the Lord, that is the first time recorded in the scripture that David ever appealed to God for 16 months. The Bible said he was in that place for one year and four months. There's 150 Psalms. You can't find one Psalm that was ever written while he was at Ziglag. Why? Because when you live in disobedience, the music stops. The communication from God stops. So if you haven't heard from God from a while, you need to check where you are. And the wonderful thing to me was, first time in 16 months, Lord, shall I pursue? The Lord was so fast. Yeah, man, pursue. you get all your stuff back. God wasn't mad. He wasn't ticked off. Now he was a part of our movement. He would have been mad. The superintendent would have shot him and the district board would have fired him. But, but, but not God. God just turned around and said, go after him, man. Get your stuff back. Never brought up the 16 months that there's no record that he ever prayed or ever wrote a psalm. Because mm. God don't bring up that stuff. Stupid people bring up that stuff. That's why you have to kind of interact with stupid people, and then you have to hear the wise God, and you'll hear it. I hope I made sense. Amen. So, the, you know, the apostles say to try the spirits. Yep, to see whether they're of God or not. So that's, that's what we're doing. You, know, that's when, what, when the Lord... you have to feel. If happily we might find him sometimes you sometimes you don't know and 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 i'm i'm not a virgin voice here i'm telling you there's times i prayed and asked god for direction and it was almost like god seemed to say i'm not talking today so you have to fellowship the silence of heaven how do you do that by what you know from the past when you don't have a present word and direction 
to give you than fall back on your past and turn around and say, wait a minute, he helped me there. He's going to help me here. There's some reason why I'm not getting definite direction, but I'm going to keep praying and I'm going to live according to what he's been. Because faithful is he who called you, who will also do it. Amen. 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 Okay. Hallelujah. What do I know? I'm Woo. just an old unemployed guy. So, so we have two more questions. They two both, more questions. They both come from Michael Winsky. And uh, the, the first one is how to thrive with no ministerial Oh, help. I got that on the back of my page here. Well, I'll just give you my answer on that. I wrote it back right here. Mm -hmm. He's how to thrive when you have no ministerial help. I wrote here, I'm the president of that club. I don't have one or two or three people in 40 some odd years across here just called me just to see how I was doing. Nobody ever calls me and said, I'm praying for you. Uh, I want to encourage you. So what you have to do is you have to learn like David of old, when all that negative, stupid stuff was going on, he encouraged himself in the Lord. And, and I've never heard anybody preach on it. I mean, I've heard him preach on that, but they never got it right. Said, how do you encourage yourself in the Lord? Fall on your past. He couldn't fall on the present because he'd been 16 months disobedient. I know one thing. He brought me out of darkness before. He brought me out of tough times before. I know what I'll do. I'll go to the God that I haven't talked to for 16 months because he's good and he's kind and he's precious. So I hate it for you that have asked the question because you don't have any ministerial encouragement. I don't mean to be rude, but it's just natural for me. So what? So you, you don't need them to blow your nose. You don't need their approval. What, what in the world's the matter with you? What, why do I need to be encouraged by anybody? I thought your business is with J-E-S-U-S. -S. Yeah, it makes it easier at times to be encouraged. But I'll tell you what it does do. When you don't have any ministerial encouragement, it forces you back on him. It throws you back on him. And you say, turn around. Well, I've got to walk with God. It, listen, all these years, this is, I've lived in a loneliness. I've lived in a isolation. I've lived, see, I've known tens of thousands of people, and I've known by a lot of people. But I don't hardly have no friends. And I don't have anybody that just checks and you check on me all the time. But other than that, I don't have ministers calling around and saying, Hey, JW, how you doing? You encouraged? Have you got the flu? What's going on with the I don't do that stuff. I've learned to live on my knees. I've learned to be sensitive to God. And I've learned how to overcome the loneliness. Because loneliness is a terrible thing. But let me tell you something. Almost all the great people that I've studied that God has ever used, Abraham, Elijah, Samuel, these wonderful men of God, Isaiah, they were all loners. Mm -hmm. Nobody was wiping their nose. Nobody was patting them with talcum powder. I mean, you got to learn to just stand alone. Doesn't mean you're better. and doesn't mean you're a wacko. It just means that when you are wanting revival and you're wanting renewal and you're wanting the power of God to work. Oh, that's not even my question. The question you're talking about when you have no ministerial courtesy. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry for you. I hate it that you don't. But you can encourage yourself in the Lord. And you can turn around and you can... I'll tell you what I wrote in my notes over here. You need to ask God to raise up in your life a Jonathan. Because Saul was trying to kill David. And David had to live lonely. You know, that's another thing. David is pregnant with a promise of a palace. Mm -hmm. But he's living in a cave. <laughs> he's got a promise of promotion. But he's dealing with, with problems. He's got a guy that hates him. It, it's, it's one of those things you just say, what in the world, man? So you just have to encourage yourself and say, my business is with J-E-S-U-S. -S. That's it. It's always been my business. And I'm saying, well, you know, I hate it. I, there's been times, Alex, I've asked the Lord and I've asked myself, why does anybody like me? I'm a nice guy. Maybe they just presume or assume that I got some kind of greatness or something because I preach a lot of sermons. I don't know. But, you know, being alone is a is a painful thing and a lonely thing, but, you know, when you are having to deal with that, remember, you're in good company. 
Elijah, Samuel, Elisha, these wonderful men of God. Amen. Even Paul said, all men forsook me, but the Lord stood by Amen. me. So Hallelujah. I hope I answered your question. So, you know, the, the Lord says, come out from among them and be ye separate people. Say so the Lord. There, there's the separation from the world, but also from your brethren. Oh, yeah, because because one of the problems that I see that's happening to us in our movement, people are happy with status quo. They enjoy being average. I never wanted to be average. I wanted to be super average, above average. I wanted to walk with God in the spirit. I wanted to be able to accomplish. Every day of my life, Alex, even today, I pray, Lord, help me. I want to be great for you. I want to be mighty for you. That's not ego. We got a world full of sin and all mob violence and crazy junk and political havoc going on and carnality in the church. That's not wrong to want to be supernatural and spiritual and to and to be great for God. Why would anybody in their right mind say, I'd like to be average? Would you please make me so I'm mediocre? Could could you help me to be mundane? One of the problems you have, which I think, is that so many of our people, especially preachers, want to fit in. I want to be in the clique. I want to be in the club. I don't want to make waves. Well, okay. But if you're going to hear from God and you're going to walk in the Spirit, you're going to try to live for God, you'll find out you're not going to be crowded with a lot of people saying, great job, man, wonderful, keep it up. You know, it's like, so anyway. All right, so we have uh, one more question. One more question. What is going to take to truly see a revival in this day and age. Okay, I'll read it to you. I found it here. It's Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, wherein is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We'll not walk therein. Now God turned around to them and said, Ask for the old paths, Wherein is the good way? And walk there. And the people said, we ain't walking in that ways. So you have to understand something. When you're reaching for revival, you'll be reaching alone. That's why I always say, try to find somebody in your circle that's like-minded. So you could discuss scripture. So you could have somebody on your prayer team that you could pray and let's have a breakthrough. And let's, that's why I said ask for a Jonathan that could encourage you. There's another scripture over in, in Genesis 13, which I wrote down. I'll just quote it. And Abraham had gone into Egypt and he lied and he schemed to, to save him, him and his wife. And the Pharaoh threw, kind of threw him out. Okay, And here's what it says. I think it's 13 and 4. And Abraham returned under the place of his first altar. That's one of the keys for revival. Remember how you first prayed? Remember how excited you were about church? Now, the best of us, that excitement wanes. That life takes that away from us. So you have to renew. And you said, we used to sing that, take me back to the place I first we don't sing that song anymore. We think it's anti-God. We don't sing it anymore. But we used to sing it. And, and and Abraham turned around with all his wealth and all his blessings. He said, you know what? I got to get back to that place where I built my first altar. And I got to have communication with him again like I did when I first started. Alex, here's an amazing thing that God let me see. I've been doing this 46 years. I never saw this. All the time that Abraham was in Egypt, he never built an altar. Never built an altar. Can't find it anywhere. He went back to Egypt for protection and stuff. He never built an altar. And he looked at all the idols and all the craziness going on and said, this ain't the right thing. I'm going back to Bethel and the Hai, where I first my sin, and I went back and I worshiped and magnified God again. If you're going to have revival, you've got to ask for the old paths. Wherein is the good way? There's nothing wrong with progress. We need progress. But there are some old principles that we need to hold on to 
you know, I hope I'm answering your question. How are we going to have revival? Real easy. You got to have a personal breakthrough. Years ago, because of times, I preached a wonderful message. At least I thought it was wonderful. Said he, God warned Moses to put a barrier around the mountain lest they break through and gaze on the Lord. He said, and if they break through, I will break forth. So he was going to break forth in judgment and anger. But that principle is good for us now. If we will break through, he's promised to break forth in blessings and miracles and healings to help us and to encourage us. But, but I got something to tell you. How are you going to have a real revival? Real revival doesn't have a cheap price tag on it. It requires, I mean, should say, it requires diligence on our part to deny ourselves. You know, we Pentecostals, I think we've misread that scripture. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up the cross. We replace that with deny things. He didn't say deny things. He said, deny yourself. The things will take care of themselves if you deny yourself. Here's another thing. Is that my last question? Mm -hmm. I got another thing I want to say. The Bible, <laughs> the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now, to me, that tells me that the desires that are born out of delighting God are the only ones he's going to answer. Mm -hmm. There's people say, I want a Mercedes. I want a new house. I want a car. I want a horse. No, 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 no. Delight yourself in the Lord. That delighting will give birth to the right desires. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. I think it's in, uh, where did I wrote this down? I think it's in Psalms. Here it is, 18 and 19. I wrote this down. I've never heard anybody preach on this yet either. David said, The Lord delighted in me, therefore he delivered me. So I guess what i got to ask you sweet people is now, ask yourself, is God delighted in me or am I a pain in the neck? Is God delighted in me or do I bring him grief and sadness and sorrow? Because, and a little further, and do you delight yourself in God? Or is church a pain in the neck? Is prayer a pain in the neck? Is doctrine a pain in the neck? If you don't delight yourself in God, you're not going to have the right desires. But David said, because the Lord delighted in me. That doesn't mean David was right in everything. He made mistakes. He had shortcomings. It's not about perfection. It's about honesty. It's about transparency. I don't, you want revival, whoever asked me that question? Then ask God to make you more naked and more transparent so that, that you would please God. I want to ask you something before I pull out of here. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Am I pleasing God or am I grieving God? Because hmm. the Bible said Enoch, before his translation, had this testimony. He pleased God. Now, there's a sermon for all you preachers that don't like to pray and get on the Internet. Get, I'll give you one right now. Testimony for translation. you got to please God. If you do not get divine approval, I promise you, you're not going to experience divine removal. It ain't going to happen. You've got to please God. And so that means we've got to examine our motives, our actions, our agendas. That means when we have bad thoughts, bad feelings, we get embittered about something, we get hurt about something, we get angry about something, we've got to ask God to cleanse us and wash us. Every day of my life, folks, I pray, I pray every day of my life, God grant me to have a right attitude and a right outlook and a right motive. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to be unkind to people. Help me to be kind and generous to people, to be Christ-like. I'll be 76 years old in just a few days. I keep thinking I'm 40, but I'll be 76. I haven't changed my drive yet. I want to please God. And uh, all I can tell you is sometimes in your effort to please God, people get offended at you. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but they just do. Just remember, the greatest man that ever lived on this planet was Jesus Christ, and all kinds of people were offended at him all the time. Not because he was rude or crude, but because he told the truth and he lived in the Spirit, and he, and he tried to please the heavens. That's it. 
Well, I had a lot of things I wanted to say here, but I guess I don't need to say. I would like to say one last thing if I could. I hope I'm not being too long. Well, two things I want to say. One is, we talk about revival. I've said this all over the movement. The promises of God are not self-fulfilling. I don't care what headquarters said. I don't care what all that crazy stuff they said. Don't believe it. Listen to me. I'm, I'm smarter than I look. The promises of God are not self-fulfilling. The promises of God are simply revelations of divine intention that God gives to us to inspire us to act. That's what he did with David. He gave him a promise. Thou shalt surely recover all. But nothing happened. That was an intention. But it inspired David to act. And that's the way it, it has to be. The other thing which the Lord has just given me this last few weeks, and it's so mind-boggling. It's about being broken. You want real revival? Break me, Lord. If I'm caustic, if I'm rude, if I'm sharp, if I'm not tender-hearted, break me. Lord, because Paul writes to the Ephesians church, being tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. So when you look at this brokenness, here's a great statement. Watch. People have something in their life, a toy, an item, whatever, and it gets broken. People now say the broken item is useless. God looks at people who remain unbroken, and he calls them useless. Because he only uses what's being willing to be broken. Thank you for letting me talk to you. I hope I haven't been a pain in the neck, and, the, and I, I tried to help as best I can. I know I'm not qualified for all this, but thank you anyway. God bless. And be safe. Amen. We pray that um, you have been blessed. <clears throat> that you have been challenged, that uh, you have been inspired to go deeper into the things of God and to go forward and continue doing the work that God has called you. After this video, we have the link to so you can post questions, and we ask that you continue posting these questions. May the Lord bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.